Well, good morning and welcome to the Gospel of John Bible class. We're in John chapters, or just chapter 11. We're going through verses 1 to 16 today. But first, let's pray. Father above, we're very grateful that you have your word for us today. Speak to us. Stop our words and give us your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, that we would see in what you are declaring to us all of your good gifts. We ask that this would be a benefit to us, to our faith in you, but also to our neighbor as you work in and through us for their good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, well, what are we doing here? in the Gospel of John. I'll uh, draw you a little pic across the top here. Look at this. We, in, when chapter 10 ended, Jesus had just fled the temple. And um, if you recall, they, they had the stones. They had picked up their stones to stone him. And off he went. And he went, well, about as far away as you could go uh, from the temple, that is to say, he went to the Jordan River uh, and outside the door, Jordan there to the place named Bethany. So he, uh, he was, Bethany of the Jordan, way out there, fled from Jerusalem. He went from one end to the other. Uh, the Jew, Jews having cornered him. And the reason, why did all this happen? Why did this movement happen? Is because there in the temple he had declared himself to be God and that was why they were going to stone him. So you know that there's not going to be much left to this story. He can't go back to Jerusalem or it's going to go down. Well, that's what happens. John's gospel is nearing the end, so to say. And so we get to see now what happens next. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Lazarus is sick. He's going to die. Jesus' close friend, the one he loves, is terminally ill laid up in bed, and more than that, Jesus knows the whole family. Mary and Martha, he's shown incredible mercy on them before, we're reminded here, in verse 2. He forgave Mary of her past sinful life. Surely Jesus will go to Lazarus, help him, save him, like he has all these other strangers or Mary. But there's a problem. Lazarus lives in Bethany a village with an eyesight of Jerusalem. And so the plot thickens. This is well within the range of those who want to kill Jesus. This is the same as walking into certain death for him. What will he do? Now this is a worthy question for you to enter today. You have to think about this. Jesus has helped you in the past. He has helped your family. But what about when it's life and death? Are you really going to trust him with that great empty nothing, with that endless mouth of chaos waiting to consume you? To what depth of darkness can you trust Christ? And what about when it will cost him his life? Will he hold back from helping you when his life is at risk? Now, there are some very interesting details here in this text. The word, Beth, uh, the word Lazarus means God has helped. He's helped all his life, but now what about in death? Bethany means house of figs and actually is a fantastic one. This takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Figs do, doesn't it? Take us back to the, that mountain with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at the top, or sorry, uh, uh, the tree of life at the top, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil just a little bit in the middle of the garden with that other tree. But a little further down, 
You remember the tree of figs. That, see, that's pastor's tree of figs, see? Because we're talking about the word Bethany, which means house of figs. Now you're thinking, why are you talking about this, pastor? Well, look at this. The figs are close to the top of the mountain. This is Eden. This is in the Garden of Paradise. Adam and Eve hid themselves with fig leaves. That's what was close when they started coming down, when the fall had started. And so what do we see? Right beside Jerusalem is this place where Lazarus lives. Here, I'll draw a fig tree here. Where the figs are. Jerusalem, of course, being at the top. This is, this is Jerusalem up here on the top. You always go up to Jerusalem. Figs are what Adam and Eve immediately used as they fell off. They, they, brought, they brought death into the world on the way down falling, and they covered themselves with figs. So what is Jesus doing here? What is he showing here in the house of figs? Well, by the end, by the end of this chapter, he is going to show that he has come to remove the covering on dead Lazarus. He's going to raise him from the dead and unwrap the false garments, the death garments, like those of Adam and Eve. For in the very next chapter, in chapter 12, he is headed for Jerusalem and he is going up. He's on his, Jesus, Jesus is on his way up and he's at the level of the figs at this point. But in chapter 12, he's going to be right into the temple, right into Jerusalem itself. Incredible. Now, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This illness. Lazarus' illness? Yes. But John has been programmatic throughout the entire gospel. What is true for Lazarus is true for the humanity cosmically. What is true for him personally is true in the big picture. The glory that God will reveal in raising Lazarus from the dead is the glory of his son. The glory of the resurrection of the dead in Jesus. The glory of a new humanity raised up in Christ and brought to the Father. A cosmic victory that this personal victory is pointing to. Yes, it's what follows in the remaining chapters of the book of John. Yep, this is an 11. And 12 is the cosmic victory. Personal resurrection followed by the full salvation of the universe. Lazarus will not stay dead, Jesus says. This does not lead to death. He's not going to stay dead and neither will humanity, neither will I, and neither will you. Sin does not get the last say. Death does not get the final word. I am leading humanity through illness, sin, and death to resurrection and life. This is my glory. That's the glory of God. Now, what I'm going to do for these next verses, I'm going to read them. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to struggle with them. Are you ready? Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, 
so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. He waited. Why did he wait? We're told it's not for lack of love. We're told it's not because of any risk to himself. Why did Jesus wait? And wait just long enough for Lazarus, his dear one, to die. You really need to enter this story with him here, beloved. For here you really get to see what Jesus is doing by coming into the world. Look, Jesus uses those closest to him in special ways to manifest his glory more clearly. Strangers, they're healed immediately. But his dear ones, those who are named, who we know, these ones carry the cross with him. They show greater faith. They wait for God's timing and action, and God uses them to manifest his glory. Beloved, he is doing this with you. Don't look on your cross, your struggle, your hardships with disdain. Embrace them. Pick up your cross and follow him. Nothing in the world matters unless it reveals and magnifies the life that God has given in Jesus. Understand all of these trials in Christ. That's how he would have you understand them in him, in his death on the cross for the sake of what he's revealing there and what he's doing in and through you in the lives of the people around you watching. Did you hear that? Did you notice that? Did you catch that in the text? All the things will be brought to point to this for those who have eyes to see. And here he implores us to see suffering in this way, to see our own suffering in the light of his cross. May God grant us such faith to be considered close to him like Lazarus. Now, what about with the disciples? Huh. Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going to go there again? <laughs> they know what's going on. They are concerned for him, and they're concerned for themselves. Jesus reminds them that he is the light of this world. He is the one. Don't be surprised, he's telling them. This is all about faith. There is one true light, and there's only light in me, dear ones. You walk with me no matter where I trod. Where's that picture? No matter where I go, no matter where I trod, no matter how dark it gets, follow me. Walk in the day, and you will not stumble, for I am the one light of the world. Finally, we get to hear how Jesus understands Lazarus' death. What do you say? I love this one. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. See that? For Jesus, death is no more serious than sleep. At his word, it is merely waking up. What a friend. One who wakes you from death like it's an afternoon nap that went a little bit too long. Thanks be to God. Where is Lazarus? It's like, hey, wake up. A little, little gentle shake. In the Navy, that's what we did when we were waking people up for, uh, for watch. They'd be in their rack. Well, I didn't have a headboard, but you get the idea. And you'd come and you'd shake them. So everybody took turns shaking each other and you'd go in there and you'd just give them a little, little, little shove and you'd say, all right, you're up, tag. 
Jesus says, I have the watch. I'm watching. And you can go. You can have your nap. You can lay down in dust and death. And you can be confident that I have the watch. And I will awaken you. It's like, it's like just saying, wake up from sleep to me. This is all about faith, isn't it? I love this part. Because they think, well, hey, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to recover. Uh, no. Lazarus has died. He's really dead, gents. And in an odd turn of phrase, Jesus is glad for the sake of faith. Isn't that amazing? For your sake, I'm glad that Lazarus has died. What? Who can say this? The Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus uses Lazarus for the other disciples' faith. Look. They're seeing it. They're seeing it. He uses Lazarus for the benefit of the faith of those who are watching. The faith of others, other disciples, others who he is bringing to faith. So don't be surprised if he uses you for the faith of those around you. In fact, do one better. Expect it. Desire it. Ask him to do this with you. Ask him to make your faith strong enough that he can use you in this way for the benefit of others. Now, this is true, not simply for your phys of your physical death. He doesn't just use your physical death and your physical sufferings um, or some, some sort of thing like that. This is true of the old Adam in each of us. And you know what I mean. When others see you humbly die to yourself, deny yourself, let your selfish desires have no claim on you. When they're watching you do that, this is glorious in their eyes. Your neighbor, neighbors are struggling to understand what they're looking at. No one does this, putting to death their um, old Adam, putting to death all their own selfishness. No one does this. So when you do it, this is not of the world. And when the Holy Spirit works in you, he's revealing the glory of the Son in you. The glory of death to the old and the rising up of the new you, the eternal you, the you of faith. This happens, dear ones, every day. God is doing it in and through you. And here he calls you to remember, to pay attention, to keep Christ before your eyes all the time and understand your life in him because your faith is on full display. Now, don't you love Thomas? He always gets the good parts here. Look at this. So Thomas said to his fellow disciples, I love this. We're going to do this. Let us also go that we may die with him, with Jesus. If he's going to march into the mouth of the lion, if he's going to go die to death in Judea, let's go. This is a question for us. Are we going to go with him? Do we follow him into certain death? Not just trust him in it, but walk with him into it. And the answer is yes. This is the path to life. This is his way through. In fact, there is no other way. Let's pray. Father above, you've put some very deep questions on us today. You've asked up us if we can wait when death is near. You've asked us if we can Follow your son into certain death. You've asked us if we will trust you. Strengthen our faith. You do the strengthening of our faith. Speak that word again and again to us. Show us again how Christ is so for us that his words, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his life is ours. That's why he's come. Strengthen our faith for this reason and use us. Don't let us simply receive but use us as a conduit. Use our life. 
Use our bodies. Use everything about us, just as you did with your son, to strengthen the faith of the people you put around us. We ask this in his name. Amen. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the first little bit. Lazarus will be alive by the end. Don't worry. We'll see you next time. <laughs>